Praise the Lord again. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. And um, praise the Lord. I'm very glad to be in church this morning. Amen. Amen. Let me um, do something before I forget it. There we go. Praise the Lord. Amen. Um, I was in prayer this week, and I don't have a Mother's Day sermon, uh, but I've been with the Lord anyway. <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to share some things. And I, Last week, uh, I shared a, a message about hopelessness, and it came as a word of the Lord uh, in our men's group a week ago and different things like that. I'm, I'm talking on hopelessness. This week, what happened is I was meditating on what God was saying last week, and Basically, the, he dropped the word purpose in my heart and um, talked about purpose. So I want to talk this morning a little bit about purpose uh, with, with the hopelessness that we, coming off that same message. Um, but uh, the title of my message this morning is Increased Comprehension of Purpose. How many know that, how many here are born? Like nobody here hatched? And certainly nobody here fell out of heaven. I know this church. Praise the Lord. So how many know we were born? Uh, but, I mean, you know, before you were born, God had a purpose for your life. Amen. Amen? Some people will live an entire life and never realize that. Some people will go through an entire uh, living, experiences, whatever, um, marriage, live, die, and, and never understand that God had a particular purpose for their life. Here's the problem is, how I many know that God, the Bible says this, it says that the, the very world, is held up, uh, the universe actually is held up by the Word of God. Uh, also, uh, His Word never ends. His Word is always, God is always giving His Word. But I've heard Christians say over the years that they, they have a hard time hearing what God is saying. So basically what happens is, is God speaks in ways that we uh, uh, don't comprehend. So if we're listening only to what we hear God speak in what we comprehend, we're only getting about 10% of what he's really saying. Amen? And, uh, but how many's ever gone into a, a, a session or a room and they can't explain it, but they just feel a presence of God? How many's ever had that experience? Raise your hand if you've had that experience where you come in and you just felt the presence of God. That's him speaking. That's also is a, is a way God speaks. Uh, through his presence and through different things. I, I want to talk about this this morning because um, before we understand the purpose of God, we, under, we need to understand how he speaks and what he says. One thing he's given us is word, okay? We can study this word, we can look through the word, and God can speak through that word. How many ever read the Bible and all of a sudden the scripture just seems to leap off the page? And, uh, and that's him speaking, praise the Lord. I shared this a, uh, a while ago. I didn't get a chance to share it on a live stream. You've probably heard this before, but just bear with me to the end. Uh, uh, there was a professor uh, that asked his students, does evil exist? And, and then he asked the question, he said, and did God create evil? In other words, God created everything and evil exists, and God, with the professor was trying to get across that then God created evil. And uh, a student uh, stood up and asked the professor, he says, um, he says uh, can I ask a question? And, and the, the professor said, of, of course. So the student gets up, he says, does darkness exist? Now this is a, this is a college student where they're talking about um, different uh, theories of energy and different things like that anyway. So and, uh, he, was, he was saying, does darkness exist? And the professor says, of course darkness exists. Uh, uh, the lights go out. Nighttime is dark. Darkness does exist. And the student promptly said, no, darkness is the absence of light. Darkness does not exist. It's the absence of light. It's what's left over when you take away light. Light being generated by an energy. So therefore, the, the, the energy that's being generated causes darkness to dispel. Take away the energy. And of course, the, so darkness doesn't exist. Darkness is just absence of light. So then he asked, the student asked again, he says, does cold exist? The professor says, of course cold exists. You're hot, you're cold, colds exist. And he says, he says, no, cold does not exist. Cold is just the absence of heat. He says, take away the heat, again, the energy, take away the energy, and, and you have, have cold. He says, so cold uh, doesn't exist. He says, cold is merely the absence of heat. And then he says, does evil exist? Returning your question, does evil exist? 
And he says, no, evil is the absence of God. When you take God away, evil uh, is, is left, it fills a void. I was thinking about that. Of course, uh, I shared that with the men's meeting, whatever, one of the meetings I shared. Yeah, Jim, because Jim was there. Jim looked it up and he said that basically the student that that story is about was Albert Einstein. I thought that was kind of interesting, so Jim had added his um, take on it, as he usually does when I say something. Praise the Lord, but uh, amen. I got meditating on this thing, and I got meditating on the fact that um, we are dealing with a generation that is basically one of the key things that's uh, attacking the generation today is a sense of hopelessness. Um, Christian brought it to light again in a men's meeting. He said his generation, that was the age of 20 or so like that. I shared it last week. Uh, but hopelessness was um, one of the key issues in his generation, as he noticed. Okay, praise the Lord. And, I says, and then, I, then as I was reading this, it hit me. Hopelessness, does hopelessness exist? Hopelessness is the absence of God's purpose. If I have no purpose for being here, why do I want to be here? If there is nothing more to life than just, well, do the best you can, survive, and be in a survival mode, and when it's over, it's over. I mean, that's what the world tries to pr pr uh, promote. Goes completely against God. That's a, that's a, a, a calculation that doesn't uh, call, calculate God in the picture whatsoever. So basically, hopelessness will exist if you have no godly purpose. If you have no purpose of God, then hopelessness will exist. So everything that you do without purpose, everything that you do then is just a matter of survival. I only go to work because so, I get paid. I get paid so I can buy stuff, so I can exist for me and my family or whatever, uh, so I can exist. So basically, there's just an existence. When I get too old to work, I can retire and live off of any money the government gives me or whatever I can manage to save. So basically, that's all. when that is all gone and my life is over, then it's all for nothing. I'm going to tell you, to believe that takes more faith than to believe in God <laughs> because that is, that is hopelessness. That's a hopeless situation of what I just described. But a person that has a purpose with God, it doesn't matter what that purpose is. When you recognize God's purpose, you know you have quality of life. When you recognize God's purpose, you're, you're here for, for, for as long as that purpose is, uh, is fulfilling God's uh, design. Amen? With that, I'm going to uh, get into too much of it. Jeremiah 1, and verse 5, everybody knows this thing, but Jeremiah uh, picks up on this, and I like the way Jeremiah uh, uh, reveals this truth and how he presents it. He says this, he says, or actually God is speaking to Jeremiah, the prophet. First chapter, he starts his book right off of this uh, uh, in, in verse 5. He says, he says, before I formed you, this is God speaking to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, in other words, before your parents got together and conceived you, he said, before that, listen to what he says, before your, he says, I knew you. Amen. He knew us before we existed, before we were even uh, conceived. He says, before you were born, I sanctified you. Wow. Think about this. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So God is saying before your parents ever got together, before even a seed exists, before anything at all existed here in the natural, he said, I knew who you were, and I got your purpose all lined up. Now, did Jeremiah, was he born a person that had a free will? Of course he was. He wasn't enslaved to God. He basically was recognizing God was revealing something, a truth that he, that, that he had him ordained from the very beginning. Ordained, set apart. In other words, I've got this, 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 this guy who's going to be born such and such a date or whatever to, these, to this couple of this parents. He said, I've got this guy, but I've already got him ordained. I've already got him set aside for a purpose. Let me, may I suggest to you this morning, God has that for every one of us sitting in this room. Before you were even born, before you were even a thought of your parents, he has a purpose and he had a plan and he's already ordained you for that purpose. So I want to get that out of the way. First of all, everybody has a godly, God-given purpose. 
Whether you believe in him or not makes no difference. He still has that purpose. Whether Jeremiah ever prophesied for him or, 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 or prophesied to the nations, regardless, God had him set aside for that. So it isn't the fact that God is going to force this purpose upon you, but we get to discover that purpose, and in that discovery, we get to serve him and we fulfill our purpose. True happiness, hopefulness, comes from that. Hopelessness comes from the absence of even recognizing that we have a purpose. You know what? When I grew up, there was, it never even entered my mind that I would be in a, a, a pastor of any kind. Preacher, that matter. Uh, matter of fact, all my natural, uh, everything about me naturally would dictate against that particular thing simply because you couldn't get two people in the room uh, uh, asking me questions without stammering and stuttering. I had, I, I, had, I had a nervous condition when it came to, to, to crowds and speaking to people. From that, God <laughs> took a person and said, okay, I have a purpose for you. For that, he sends me to the multitudes in, in, in Africa in different countries in different places around the world in five different continents to preach his gospel. So he picked somebody with a stammering, stuttering, <laughs> who was nervous and, and didn't have any self-esteem whatsoever and begin, except for making a living, I could do that. But was, I took that with seemingly very little education in any of the things and caused the, to go forth to the nations and to begin to prophesy, not only prophesy, but uh, 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 traveling with other ministers, we, we laid hands, we did miracles, and all of them things. From, uh, uh, I mean, it was, we're talking about uh, uh, from England to, to, to West Africa, uh, Peru, Chile, uh, Guatemala, uh, um, um, you name it. I mean, the, the nations have been Ireland, uh, uh, different places like that. And, 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 and God being able to take my life exposed me to those cultures and began to, 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 to raise me and train me up. So I'm not a, I'm not a product of a, uh, of a Bible college, though I did go to Bible college uh, for, the, for the basic learning. I'm not a product of a, of a university. I'm not a product of, of, of uh, um, anything other than the fact that God had chose me and I had the sensitivity at one time to just listen and lean into to what he had to say about my purpose. That's my testimony. And now, here I am, uh, 34 years since we started the church in Key West, it was a couple of years, so about 37, 30, almost 40 years now uh, of, of preaching the gospel for, for the Lord. That's just preaching the gospel. Before that, I worked in the church and worked with my pastor and it's different things like that. Uh, before that, I was in a religious church and, and got born again. For, you know, so it so always has, has a before. But the fact is, when Jeremiah said, when God told Jeremiah, says, this is no surprise to me. He said, understand something. Another thing that stood out this, this week is what I shared. Uh, I, I didn't get a chance to read it. I got a chance to, to mention it last Sunday. But Matthew chapter 12, in verse 9 through 12, it says this. He says, now when, Jesus, when uh, he had departed from there, talking about Jesus, he, he went into the synagogue, and behold, there was a man there with a withered hand. And he asked him and said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? This is what they were trying to ask him to, to, in other words, to try to trap Jesus. So the religious leader said, is it lawful? See, religion is concerned about the law. God is considered about the love of the Father. Amen. And godly people are considered about the love of the Father, not the law. But Jesus, so they said, trying to accuse him. But Jesus said this, he said, what man amongst you, in other words, the ones that are saying this, what man amongst you has one sheep that falls in a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay, uh, lay hold of it and lift it out? on the Sabbath, even though it's a Sabbath where we don't work. Of course, all of them would have to say, yeah, because that sheep is money that's, that's value, that has value to it. And then, so Jesus re returns, he says, how much more value is this man than a sheep? And that particular statement struck me. How much more value is a man than a sheep? Therefore, is it, it, therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. How much more value does a person have? When God calls us or gives us our purpose, isn't it amazing it's not for our self-esteem? Self, now, we can get self-esteem from that. We, I'm, I'm glad. I was so thrilled when, when I found out my purpose with God and, and, and begin right away in, in, that, in that vocation. But don't you understand that even what I do today has nothing really to do with me? 
my purpose that God has given for me is to help other people. So over the years, even though we've been positioned in Key West and so on and so forth, even over the years, God has positioned us to help thousands of people right where we're at from our home, home state, not counting the, the, the thousands and the tens of thousands I minister to overseas. So all of a sudden, a single life that doesn't have much value except a, a provider for his family, uh, working the best way it can, labor and doing everything it, it can possibly do to make enough money to survive, God's perspective of what we have uh, or what we are is different from what we see ourselves. God's perspective is, you know, they, that's all they see. What I have them set apart for, there's thousands and there's even tens of thousands of people watching my live stream that I'm affecting as the words go forth from my purpose-driven pastor, okay, in my purpose, I'm taking those words, put them in people's hearts, and cause an effect that saves lives. Think about that. So after reviewing this and after reviewing this, one thing, I was happy I didn't miss it. <laughs> Another thing, I was, I was overwhelmed by the goodness and the mercy of God to pick somebody like me to go ahead and, 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 and be kind of a mouthpiece who before couldn't even hardly speak without stuttering. Amen? Of course, I noticed Moses had that problem. Uh, God called him. He stuttered. And he, he said, well, how, how can I uh, talk, to, to talk to Pharaoh? The, 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 I, I got, a, I got a, a, you know, this thing. I, he said, well, if you find it hard to speak, let Aaron speak for you. Did you notice that he never had Aaron speak? <laughs> he took over from there. <laughs> There's something about a purpose-driven, a God-purpose-driven life that seems to overcome obstacles that we can't even imagine. Can't even imagine. Praise the Lord. But let me get back to this thing. How much more value is a man than a sheep? Because I had to answer this question. I'm not a shepherd. I don't have any sheep. But I had how much more value is man than my purpose-driven life trying to be a, uh, 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 to survive and be an income provider for my family. Now, there's nothing wrong with being an income provider for my family. My dad did it. I did it for my family my, and, and my kids. Want to give them the best and do the best you can. I'd work all kinds of hours over time to make enough money. But when it came to the Lord, it was different uh, uh, because now that I have a purpose, this over here is no longer my main purpose heavenly purpose is my earthly duty, but this over here now becomes my real purpose. See, there was, was a separation in the difference of what is a duty, what I should do and what I swore to do to keep my word uh, to, uh, to my wife and my family, and then there's the purpose that God laid in my heart. Okay, does one contradict the other? Maybe, but the fact is, the one that has to win out is the purpose of God over our duty or whatever we think we're trying to do. And even as you get older and retired or whatever, and you're just living your own life, I mean, know that people that take retirement and treat it like an eternal vacation die younger. They live shorter lives. They don't live as, as bountiful lives. I, I look at it this way. Like, Here I am, 72 years old. I'm going to be 73 this year, but I, I mean, and God has given me a, a, a stamina to, to, to speak to the next generation. This is, this is an honor uh, for me to God to, to, to take and put into my purpose that I can help these younger people and younger guys and, and, and give them wisdom that they, that they didn't have. Some are fatherless generations. How many, how many fatherless have come into our sanctuary, come into our church? This is just our ministry here in Key West now. How many fatherless have come in? And, and, and didn't have any guidance of that, didn't, didn't know about, didn't know what to do. I could go to my father. My father wasn't a, a minister. He was a carpenter. So I'm son of a carpenter. I have something in common <laughs> with Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. But anyway, uh, but my father wasn't a, the, a theologian or, or a theological man, but he didn't need to be. Because all he had to do is teach me how to do the duty of a father and, and, and a husband and then through that, and through that honesty, God, made, God dropped into purpose. But how many know that from the beginning, just like Jeremiah, God had purposed me to do what I'm doing? There's several times, and Key West is not the easiest place to minister as a Christian ministry. I don't know if you've noticed that. 
But the fact is, I've watched uh, uh, over the years, I've known other ministers in town, uh, denominational, non-denominational, all, all different backgrounds of theology, and would just leave this town. And I've had some of them come to me and say, how do you do this? I do what? How, how do you minister into this town? Because what happens, they would be overwhelmed by the activities of what the devil would be doing, especially down on the Ball Street, so on and so forth. And that seemed to interrupt what they had in their mind of what church should be. Me, I was just foolish enough, I guess, to see that, hey, it's the sick that need the doctor, Jesus said. It's the ones that, that, that are going to hell that needs a hand out. <laughs> All right? And, and, and it's the unrighteous that need the righteousness of God. And, and so I, I saw a new purpose in that. However, I also noticed this. I said, in our society today, uh, well, let, let, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let, let me get back to Jeremiah because I started reading more in Jeremiah. And uh, this is what I, what I also found. In Jeremiah 1, in verse 12, it says, God told Jeremiah, he says, I will watch over my word to perform it. This is like the conversation, something like the conversation he had with, with Joshua. God is continually trying to calm us down, take it to a, don't fear, don't worry. You preach, the, you just speak the word I tell you, and I'll take and I'll perform what needs to be performed over it. So God is sitting there. He's saying he's designed to co-labor with us, but he's like, make, he says, he's saying, okay, I'll co-labor with you, but step out. Do something to step out. Wow. Uh, not for your survival, because this was, this was a, a dangerous area, because if you don't know anything, anything about this, Jeremiah was watching the very city that he loved, the apple of God's eye, being uh, disassembled and destroyed by the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. Why? How did the Babylonians, able to come, over, uh, come against a strong city who had a covenant with God, a people, 12 tribes that had a covenant with God, how were they able to so easily succumb Jerusalem? Well, the Bible says that. They, there was a sin that was involved. And, a, and that sin that was involved pulled back uh, the, the uh, Spirit of God. And what God said, he says, um, he, he said in, in Jeremiah 2.13, he says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me and the fountain of living water, and they hewed themselves out cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Well, there's, what's, what's two sins? I'm looking over this thing, and I, I looked it up in one of my commentaries, and Albert Barnes' com Bible commentary says this. It says, the pagan is guilty of one sin, idolatry, but covenant people are guilty of two sins because they've abandoned the true God to serve idols. So that's what he's talking about. So the people that know God are in worse shape than the people that never knew him. And this is what Jeremiah was supposed to tell the light. So because of that sin, they had restricted God from in intervening. And basically, the Babylonians were, were able to take over. The Babylonians realized, hey, uh, their, their God isn't, isn't stepping in. We got free reign here. Let's take over the city. Now, the Babylonians had a system. Basically, they would take, first of all, uh, the people out of the city were the ones that could benefit their empire. Uh, so Daniel, uh, the smarter people like Daniel and different prophets, they would t seize them first and bring them to Babylon and pick their brains, so to speak, and try to get all the information they could to better the Babylonian uh, uh, you know, uh, empire. Then what happens is you had the rebel rousers and stuff that were left behind and caused them problems. Well, you cause problems, you rise a sword up against the Babylonian. They just kill you. After a while, I got so bad because Jerusalem would not calm down. It says, okay, we're disassembling this, the, the, the temple. We're taking it apart, and we're, we're burning the city to the ground. You, you don't realize that Jerusalem, throughout its history, has been destroyed and rebuilt about 25 times. <laughs> it just doesn't go away, <laughs> and it's still a center of things today. Praise the Lord. But anyway, this is what happened, and they're taken into captivity. If you were a brain, a high IQ, you were somebody of prominence in Jerusalem, then you would be some come, become somebody of prominence in Babylon because they wanted to take the best. The Roman Empire did the same thing. Uh, the Roman Empire uh, didn't invent as much stuff as they stole. 
uh, a lot of them they stole from the Greeks. I mean, different things that they took. Then, so this was this was a common thing for empires to do. It wasn't just going in and annihilating and killing everything. Uh, basically, it was going in and if they had something better than what we have, let's go and see how they did it, and they would take them captive. So this is the scenario. Jeremiah is watching this place be disassembled. <clears throat> and then God speaks to him again in Jeremiah 29. 29, uh, 29 11 is the, the verse everybody knows, right? Yeah. Let's go to the preceding verses before that. God speaks to Jeremiah. He said, this is what he tells the people. He said, build houses and dwell in them. In captivity? Yeah, in captivity. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens, eat their fruit. Take wives, begot sons and daughters, and take your wives and your sons and give your uh, daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may increase there and not diminish. Hang on, hang on with me, because basically I'm looking at this thing and say, wait a minute, these are slaves in captivity. And God is saying, "Uh uh-huh, and this is my purpose that has been born into them of seeds of Abraham. In other words, the outside circumstances no longer matter as far as a direction for your purpose. The things that you see and the things you know have nothing to do with your purpose. I'll tell you why. Because you will lean on those things that you're good at. And God doesn't always take the things that you're good at and line them up as purpose. That's our interpretation. That's not his interpretation. How can I have daughters and raise sons in his captivity? you got 70 years. That's what, the, that's what the penalty was for that sin, was 70 years of captivity. So he says, don't diminish. It doesn't matter what goes on around you. It doesn't matter whose slave you are. Can you, you remember Joseph? His own brothers sold him into slavery. So what happens? He's in Potiphar's house as a houseboy for a while, and then the wife has a, has a fit over that and, and, and falsely accuses him. He goes to prison, and he listens to all these other guys, gives them a word of the Lord. So they get released, and he's still in prison. Guess what? All that boils down to God's purpose will still reign. It doesn't matter his circumstances because he made it to the throne. And it was because of Joseph in Egypt on the throne is why his family and the descendants of Jacob survived. All his other brothers that sold him into captivity survived because of Joseph and his positioning that they thought they were just going to make a profit. Matter of fact, the other brothers wanted to kill him. It was Judah. (laughs) No, let's sell him. (laughs) Praise the Lord. (laughs) So what happens is when we try to discern our purpose, depending on our circumstances around us, we will get it wrong. Jeremiah, I'm sure, they called him the weeping prophet. If you look at the book of Lamentations, he wrote the book of Lamentations. Has anybody ever read the book of Lamentations for encouragement? <laughs> Has anybody ever read the book of Lamentations because they were depressed and they wanted to get out of depression? Uh-uh. Man, because what he's doing, he's penning, he's writing down all the things that he's seeing. And in Jeremiah, in his book, he's saying all the God, things God are saying. What God is saying doesn't seem to line up with what's happening. Surprise. God doesn't have to, and he doesn't spread his word depending on what we are, they were going through. His word is already settled in heaven. Your purpose has already been settled. The only thing you or I get to do about purpose is discover it. We cannot commission it. We cannot manipulate it. We cannot do anything with it. We just get to discover it. To some people, that's a scary proposition. Because if you were brought up in religion, you know what happens. Everybody called in a ministry. They go to the mission field. <laughs> well, I got news for you. That's not true. Amen? And the thing is, the purpose of God, God has purpose of all kinds of backgrounds. Amen? All professional fields. What happened in Babylon, God was showing what he can do. His purposes were being performed by his people, and his people were actually exalting Babylon to the place and degree until the 70 years were up. When the 70 years were up, you you, you look at uh, Ezra, the book of Ezra is another thing about that time period. When they left Babylon and went into Israel, do you know only a small portion that were free to go actually went? 
That tells me some people were more interested in, in, in serving Babylon and getting on the, the, the and then of course after Babylon fell, it was the Persians, so now they're in the serving the Persians. They'd rather serve the Persians than serve God. They'd rather serve the Persians than go back and start over again and rebuild a nation that's the apple of God's eye and also a part of their covenant. So it was a long time before all of them got back. And you notice when they did start rebuilding, okay, and, and Nehemiah kind of corrected him on it. He says, y'all, you build houses to stay in and all these other things. But what about the temple? The temple's still a shambles. And okay, you got the temple built now. Now what about the wall that protects this whole thing that God has given you back? Amen? Amen. Purpose is very important because when they kept the purposes that God said in Babylon, they were able to take from, the, from that purpose of God. You know, they're able to take to uh, 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 keep on having children, so on and so on. The next generation took over and rebuilt Israel to rebuild to what you see there today, some, some of the stuff today. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. But it's still there. Israel's still there. Jerusalem's still there. Amen? Amen? So no other tribes have been able to take it over or take it back. And what was all this for? <laughs> all this for so Jesus when he came he, on that Palm Sunday that we talk about he could walk through the temple and say destroy this temple in three days and I'll raise it up again <laughs> 70 AD it was destroyed again by the Roman Empire and it never did, was put back as a temple uh, Saladin um, when he uh, beat the crusaders and send them back to Europe. Uh, uh, he went ahead and set that dome of the rock that you see today on there uh, uh, to kind of in, in the face of God. Mm -hmm. Got news for you, it's too late. That eastern wall gate that they blocked up, Jesus already went through it. <laughs> he was a few hundred years late. <laughs> but anyway, so this is what was happening. Amen? We read all this and we talk about how to prosper. He said, after 70 years of complete, verse 10, he said, after 70 years of completed in Babylon, I will visit and perform my good works towards you and cause you to return to this place. So God told him, you're going to re return. This is it. Listen, do yourself a favor. Stop listening to the end time pro prophecies that are going forth now about the time we're living in. They haven't got it right in thousands of years. They're not going to get it right now. But God has a certain time where he says, enough is enough. This is it. I'm giving you back what you've lost. Now, we see that in, 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 in natural things, but uh, in all kinds of things. Uh, the thief be found, he must give back sevenfold return, so on and so forth. We, we know that. So God is a God of return, and he's a God of God. But our purpose, until he comes, we must occupy until he comes. And that's the whole idea, uh, to, to be able to stand Uphold what God has said to do. Take the purposes of God when he says to do it and then move on from there. There is where you find strength. Amen? Now, Jeremiah, this is the very famous verse that everybody puts on their refrigerator. They got bumper stickers for their car and everything else. This is the verse. Okay, Jeremiah 29, 11. It's only a few verses down of the same context. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And we rattle that off like a Gatling gun. But do you know what it means? The word thoughts, which was translated in the English thoughts, is really intentions. My intentions towards you. How many have good intentions? Is it done with good intentions? No, it depends on everything else to line up for that intention to come to pass. This is what God is saying. He said, I know the thoughts or the intentions I have towards you. He said, my intentions are a peace, not of evil. My intentions are for a future and a hope. That's my intentions. So basically, he leaves it kind of open-ended. He says, okay, now what are you going to do about it? So God actually throws the ball as it is back in our court and says, okay, here, here's my will, here's my word, here's what I promise, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do with it? Are you going to turn it into a religion of convenience? Are we only going to worship God and serve God when it's convenient for us? Or are we going to find out his purpose? Because a purpose-driven Christian is different than a, than a non-purpose-driven Christian. A non-purpose-driven Christian only knows uh, 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 form and format, events and, and ceremonies. But a purpose-driven Christian understands the Lord. A purpose-driven Christian has a communication with God because they couldn't have a purpose without his communication. Amen. 
they wouldn't know where to start. Amen? I can give you some pointers this morning on how to start. I can give you some testimony. But basically, it comes right down to what are we going to do? One of the key things that God has given me a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and here's one of the biggest things, I believe I was sharing my leadership this morning in the, in, the, in the war room. I said, I believe one of the biggest things is, do you remember when I said about the spirit of complacency? Complacency is one of the biggest enemies of the church right now, and it's a definite enemy against purpose. Hopelessness is coming because you see nothing on the other end. If you see nothing on the other end, it's hopeless. What, is it, what are we all doing this for? Why are we here? What, so on and so forth. And that's where that hopelessness comes in because there's no purpose. There's no uh, 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 purpose. Amen? <clears throat> but what happens is complacency stops us searching. It stops us from searching. It stops us from looking. And we just get complacent. We get into everyday life and we just get complacent in the things of God. Amen? I said it before. I said Psalms 84, 11 says, No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That word uprightly in the Hebrew is integrity and truth. How many know God expects us to operate in integrity and truth? Amen? Anything that's not integrity and truth is false and a lie. Praise the Lord. So these are some of the things we can do. But the miracles of God, when God re releases the miracles... They came to bring justice to the demonic realm. <clears throat> and God is looking for his church to raise up to do justice to the demonic realm. Amen. So when we get an opportunity to pray, I said, any of you think at it, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> the fact is, <clears throat> keep on praying and get better at it. But the fact is, is Jesus gave us an assignment. No man has the right to undo that assignment, regardless of the results they think they've gotten. Your purpose is the same way. It doesn't matter if people laugh at you if you mention their purpose. It doesn't matter what they think of you. Okay? It only matters what God says. And there has to be a determination to that purpose. God showed me that <clears throat> uh, years ago when I first came to Key West. And basically, our church wasn't the most popular because we spoke truth. And even when I had, they had meetings and uh, I want to meet me in my living room, my house, and, and, and a, a certain group, and try to get me to denounce those truths because it upset their religious spirit, I refused. <clears throat> and they told me, <clears throat> they basically told me this group, <clears throat> and um, they said, well, we'll have you out of this town in two weeks. You won't be here. You won't pack your bags and go back where you came from. We'll have you out of here. Uh, they had connections with the city councils and I guess, I don't know. I didn't pursue it. I says, the day you can do that, I says, the day I'll come back here and I'll thank you because this wasn't my choice, this was God's. And the last thing I want to do here <clears throat> is miss God. <clears throat> I'm still here. Most of those people are dead. Buried in the cemetery over here in Key West. I can show you some of the grave sites. But the fact is, is God's word is still here. I'm still here. In what seems to be almost impossible situations, but yet I still see the American pastor for the most part, not mentioning name, but the American pastor for the most part, will gauge his success of his ministry based on what he sees in the chairs and the pews and how many people attend. I don't. Jesus spoke to a crowd in John chapter 6 one time, and it was a crowd probably of 10,000 people or more, of women and children, we count all of them, 5,000 men and plus women and children and so on and so forth. And he says, he says I am... The, Jesus was pointing to him as himself the Messiah, but he was doing it in other terms. And they got offended, and they walked away from Jesus, never to follow him again, the Bible says in John chapter 6. And Jesus turned to the 12 and says, are you guys going to leave too? Peter pipes up, he says, where else will we find the words of life? Amen. Why? The difference between people that are seeking something as a handout to people who have a purpose why didn't disciples leave? Because of their purpose. What happened to Judas out of the 12 disciples? What happened to him? Well, he got complacent. Complacency? He was doing miracles. He went, yes, but he got complacent in his purpose. Amen. And he lost sight of it. He went back to the old purpose of making money and sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. How many remember one more start? I got to. You guys keep, keep track of my time. I didn't. <laughs> I got time. I can say it. Thank you. Okay, praise the Lord. 
Wait, stand, wait. Yeah, there you go. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, what, I remember the story of Elisha and Elijah and Elisha. But Elisha was old in 2 Kings. You find the story in 2 Kings chapter 13. Elisha was on his deathbed, and he summons the king of Israel to come to him. The king of Israel comes to him, and he weeps by his side. He says, you know, we're going to miss you, and all of a sudden, I went through all, all the other things. And the thing is, Elijah said, he says, I, want, I got a last, no, this is the last minute, last ever prophetic word I'm going to give this nation. If you follow it, it'll change this nation. In other words, is what he was assuming. That's not what it says. But he, so he said, he said, told the, the king of Israel, he says, open up the window. And the window he opened up was on the window of the east. The east window would have been towards the enemy, towards the enemy that was taken over. He says, he took, he says take your bow and put an arrow in it and pull it back. And when he did, Elisha laid hands on his hands. He said, now let it go. And the arrow went out and stuck in the ground or the turf of the enemy. He says, now take the arrow that's left in your quiver. He says, take it out. He says, and tap the ground. You know, there's one thing about a test when you know you're getting a test is one thing. But when you're getting a test that you don't know you're getting a test, you want to take it out. You want a do-over. <laughs> but with this situation, there was no do-over. What happened, the king took it, and he tapped the ground three times, tick, 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 like that, on the ground. And the Bible says, in, in, in Kings, he says, he says and, and when he says, strike the ground, he says, and the man of God was angry with him. Why? Because he only did what he was told out of ambition, but he understood. Now, this was, a, this was a prophecy that was understood. I'm shooting an arrow, which is a symbol of war. I'm shooting it towards the enemy. Now, when I tap the ground, that's how many times I'm going to beat that enemy. So even though it wasn't, he wasn't told he was getting a test, it was how he approached it. And his approach to this thing was tick, tick, tick three times. And the prophet said, Rot, that's it, you're done. In other words, you're, as a king, you're completely satisfied with a temporary victory. As a king of Israel, you're satisfied with just apathy, complacency. You're just satisfied with that. In other words, you figure that's enough. Okay, tick, tick, tick. Okay, okay, now what? Now what? Now what? Your complacency, basically in this case, the complacency and apathy, and only concerned about the temporary day to day has robbed an entire nation of its victory over its enemies once and for all. And you know the enemy is still an enemy today. So no, no wonder the prophet was wrought. Well, I didn't know why I was getting a test. Doesn't matter. The thing is about getting a test and not knowing it, it really, really reveals what's on your heart. It really reveals the purposes of God or doesn't reveal the purposes of God. You understand? So, so Elisha, when I go back to Elijah, and, and Elijah is plow, plow in, Elisha's plowing in the field. You remember the story. God had, this, uh, God had an encounter with Elijah. Elijah was wanting to go home. He wasn't suicidal, but he wanted to go home and, and be with the Lord. He was just fighting Jezebel and all the other stuff. And uh, God says, I already got people raised up to take your place. He said, but I want you to go to Elijah and throw your coat on, throw your mantle on him. In other words, he's the next choice. This is important because this is what you, what you need to look for if you're really looking for purpose. The prophet comes up. He takes his mantle, he throws it on Elisha. This is the guy that just prophesied to the king and got wrought okay, on, his, on his exit out of this world. Okay? He throws it on, his, on a, He doesn't say a word. He throws his mantle, his coat, on top of Elijah. You know the story. Elijah runs back after the prophet says, let me go home and take the thing. I'll be right with you. I'll be right with you. He says, what do I have to do with you? Forget it. Nah, nothing there. And walks away. In other words... Elijah's way of handling Elisha was not sitting there and pump him up and to inflate him and what God is going to do with him. How are you going to be a prophet? Twice the anointing and all this other stuff. He's not going to tell him all that. He goes, listen, you want to serve God, serve God. He ended up doing more for that boy than you can imagine because what happened was he knew what it meant. He knew what the prophet meant. He knew it was the word of the Lord. He went back. He slaughtered his ox. He burned the farming equipment. 
Okay, he fed off all of it. He basically laid everybody off and he went and he followed the prophet and he followed him for year after year after year. He made his bed, he, he cooked his meals, he did everything for that prophet. Amen? And finally, the prophet says to him, he says, listen, um, if you see me when I go, because everybody knew he was going, even his uh, other counterparts knew that he was going, uh, they, they teased Elisha about it. Hey, uh, uh, your, your father's going home to be with the Lord. And, and what are you going to do now without, without the man leading you and telling you? What to do? He's being mocked by the other prophets, uh, school of the prophets, I should say, uh, junior prophets. Anyway, he was being mocked. And he, didn't, he, said, he just told him one thing, shut up, and kept on walking. <laughs> shut up, and kept on walking. Amen? Praise the Lord. And then what happened was he came to the place where Elijah said, he says, you stay here, I'm going over here. He said, no, no. He said, I'm going with you. He says, as long as George the Lord lives, he said, I'm not leaving your side. I refuse. I'm not leaving. I'm not following your orders. I'm going with you. Walks a little further, and Elijah just says to him, he says, if you see me when I'm gone, he says, ask of anything, and it'll be done unto you. This is the tricky part. Because Elisha says to Elijah, I want a double portion of your anointing. Think about that. You all know the scripture. Think about that. If I have a million dollars in the bank and I'm going to give a double of what I have, how do I do that? I don't have it to give. I don't have two million dollars to give away if I only have a million. I don't have a double anointing when I only have this anointing. How do you give away double what you have? People don't see this, but what Elijah was actually saying He's saying, I've followed you for so many years. I've watched you. I've made your breakfast. I've done everything. He says, I know if I'm going to do anything that you have done at all, I need twice of what you got. He said, Get, grant me twice. Of he says, all right, here's the deal. You see me when I go. Now, how many know the scene? You got, the, when, he, when he goes, you got the chariot of fire, right? Coming down. Ah, uh-huh. You remember the test that you didn't know was a test until you went through it? Okay, that was a test. He says, see me when I go, you can have the double portion anointing. Elijah wasn't taken up in the chariot. He was taken up in the whirlwind. The chariot was a deception, or, 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 or not a deception, it was a real chariot, but a chariot of fire, was a, it was a, a, a choose. Are we going to choose that which is magnificent, or are we going to say, do what was said by the word of God? Are we going to keep and focus on that, on, on that whirlwind? Elisha was taken up in a whirlwind. You see me when I go. He didn't go in the chariot. The chariot was a, was, was a distraction. But that's pretty cool to see a chariot on fire don't burn. <laughs> you were looking for the magnificent. Oh, wow. They, oh, yeah, the world went on. Oh, no, forget it. You lost. <laughs> Aren't you glad we have God's grace today? <laughs> but this is it. But Elijah, Elisha got the training from Elijah that he wasn't going to be complacent. Do you know why? The truth, I believe the answer is right in the beginning. He never became addicted to the need of affirmation. Write that down. Elijah never became addicted. Leaders cannot become addicted to the need of affirmation. Are you here? I heard, I heard a preacher say this uh, along that same lines. He said, if you live by the praises of men, you will die by their criticism. Right. I thank God to this day that I stand here in this church that I didn't listen to my critics Amen. because they're all wrong. God has still moved this on. He's still pres preserved this thing, and we're still going out in, in full force. I'm looking for the next thing he wants to do. Right. I see God this day today in looking in his church. He's looking around his church to raise up an army for today. Amen. The church is still playing church, but God's looking for an army. Yes. Yes. Amen. The church is playing church. The church makes an event. Well, I, 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 had, a, I had people say to me, so, well, you know, uh, um, 
let, let, let me go back. I, I want to share something before. I'm out, I'm out of time. Can you give me two more minutes? Two more minutes I can do this. I want to share this because this is something that's very interesting that is missed a lot of times when we talk about Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, 8 and 10. This was, a, this was a word of the Lord, and this was an, a, 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 an assignment that he gave uh, Jeremiah. He says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets or diviners who are in the midst of you deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you have caused to be dreamed. And I started looking at that. So he says, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. And for thus saith the Lord, after 70 years are complete at Babylon, I will come and visit and perform my good works toward my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. What did he say? He says, do not listen to the prophets or diviners that are saying anything different. They're not sent of me. He said, don't listen to them. He said, this is the part I wanted to see because the Lord we know speaks through dreams. I listen to dreams for my, myself. I have my own, you know, my, my own testing. But I mean, he says, do not listen to the prophets of the Bible or, deceive, or dreams that you cause a dream. And what the Lord is showing me, he's saying that we can want something so bad. We want our way so bad that we can actually dream that and say, God is the one who gave me the dream. This was right there, Jeremiah 29, 8, 8, 8 through 10, I just, what I just read. Amen? So let me get back to, to, to Elijah. Elijah didn't have a vision. I mean, he saw the vision of the two things, but Elijah said, no, I'm listening to the word. The word was saying, if you see me when I go, I'm going to watch that man ascend into heaven because that is the word. And guess what? When he did... All the people made fun of him. Oh, what you going to do now? Oh, your father's gone. He, that's all by yourself. Now you're going to be the prophet. Oh, you're the big, big guy, big name, big guy. He didn't say a word. He took the cloak that fell from the sky that was Elijah's, the cloak that was less, rest upon his shoulders when he was plowing a field. Isn't it amazing how many times God calls people who are working? Just saying. Peter was fishing. David was watching sheep. Anyway, but he took that cloak and he walks up to the river. He says, where is the God of Elisha? In other words, he wasn't saying, did he, did he admit, where is he? Woof, and the waters parted. Guess what happened to the peanut gallery? <laughs> they shut up. Amen. Nothing to say, and he made a, prophet, made a prophet. But guess what? He passed the test. He kept going on going, but he knew his purpose. He would not get off his purpose. No matter what he saw happen, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm scrambling eggs and I'm taking care of the prophet. Yeah, I'm washing his feet, doing whatever the prophet needs. Yeah, 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 I'm just a house boy, just a house boy. With that attitude, you'll never be anything else. Amen. But he said, no, I get to manage the business of the prophet. I'm learning, I'm getting hands-on, I'm being educated, so when God speaks to me, I'll recognize the voice. It's amazing to me how people that don't even serve God want to know his voice. Amen. Prophesy to me, pastor prophesy to me. I could prophesy, but you may not like it. <laughs> because basically God will tell you, hey, see the sunshine. <laughs> Come visit me. Amen. We got anything out of the word this morning? I didn't get to. I, I didn't get to all my. But I think we got got it done. One last comment I will make. Second Peter two seven says this calls Lot righteous. I, I shared this last night. I think with the, with the group. In Romans chapter four thirty it talks about Abraham being uh, believed God and was counted for righteousness. The Bible calls Lot and Abraham both righteous. Abraham, you hear about Lot, you don't hear too much about. What's the difference? One followed the inner voice on the inside. The other looked at the outer voice. It says, in, well, it says right here for Lot, it says in Second Peter, it says, and he delivered righteous Lot into those, to the oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. He couldn't get his eyes off the filthy conduct of the Wall Street. Amen. You've got you to get your eyes off of what the devil's doing. Get your eyes on what God's doing to keep the righteousness of the covenant. Amen? 
I don't look at what the devil's doing to determine what season I'm in. I go and I ask God what season we are and what do you want me to do next? Amen? When he comes back, it's his business. He hasn't even revealed it to Jesus. Why do you think I can take, what, why do people think they can figure it out? <laughs> it's almost degrading, trying to degrade him. Well, I could be above Jesus because Jesus doesn't know. It, only the Father knows. They ask, I mean, the disciples asked Jesus that. Jesus told them, he said, no, I don't know. The Holy Spirit doesn't know. Only the Father knows. Amen. So why are we trying to find out something only the Father knows? And why do we think we can get it right? <laughs> Amen. So let me encourage you this morning. Let's do what God's called us to do. Find your purpose this morning. Well, how do I do that? Where do I start? You're starting. It starts today. You can't separate yourself. You know, I'm also going to ce celebrate 40 years of scuba diving. I've been 40 years certified. I got several certifications and surf cars and, and thousands of dives. And the fact is, 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 is um, how did I become a scuba diver? I got around other scuba divers, ones that were, uh, could instruct, ones that could teach. That's how I learned how to be a scuba diver. Amen? How do you learn to do anything? Get around the people that know. I've had, I don't know how many instructors, I could count them up, you know, 10 or more, I don't know how many, I got 11 different certifications, uh, but the fact is, is, is um, uh, how did I learn all that stuff? Each instructor taught me something. Not all of them taught me the same thing. The next level brought another instructor, the next level brought another instructor, and so on and so forth. But I learned all that from a person who knew something, right. not a person who was guessing at something. Right. Amen? Right. How do we learn anything? Get around to people and know. Get around people who know how to hear from God. Get around people that have gone past religion and gone to the true life of God. That's how you do it. You hang out with those people. Amen? Amen. So praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet. I got, I got more, but I got to stop. I didn't get into Thanksgiving. Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, Thanksgiving is, uh, releases things. I, I'll get to it next week if I get to it. Praise the Lord. But um, I do want to keep my... I got enough in here. I could preach for the next two hours. We could be here next Tuesday if you want to, but uh, the, uh, it would be hard to uh, probably listen to. <laughs> anyway, but I'm going to get something out of the Word this morning. Um, get we, we talk about this a lot of times. How many want to hunger for God? How many want to have a hunger to be in His presence? You can't say that if you're not willing to to look for his purpose. God, if God has ordained, even before you were conceived in your mother's womb, had a purpose for your life, okay, if, he's, if that, that's the truth, which I believe is the truth, by the way, then how can anything else be satisfied if we just want to visit him once in a while but never want anything to do with his purpose? The only time that people really don't want anything to do with God's purpose is when they have an agenda of their own. But even with that, I have agendas. No wrong with agenda. I have agendas, but I never let my agenda interfere with God's purpose. Amen. Amen. And what it, with, with that, not only do I have an agenda, or do I, I, I have pleasure, the Lord allows me to do things that I can do. Uh, with people my age can't do, I can do. Amen. So praise the Lord. But the fact is, God's purpose has to come first. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I, 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 I hope I got it across good enough this morning. I feel this is an important subject, very important, because if we don't know our purpose, we don't have any direction. Uh, uh, we need the direction nowadays more than we never need direction. Lord, help people understand your purpose and help them, Lord, to get fixed in that in the name of Jesus. We love all people because people are more important man's value is greater than anything else. A man's value is greater than the work in the ministry. Amen. A man's value is greater than any job that we have. A, ma a man's value is more valuable than a baby whale in the ocean. Praise the Lord. Amen. A man is more valuable, and therefore it is decent to do good works on the Sabbath. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for it in the name of Jesus.
to bless the people that heard and listened to your word this morning, uh, even in other nations. We just give you the praise. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.